Chapter 11. The Vision. It was Brad's freshman year in high school, and the basement under Grandma Mary's house was cool and damp. The odor of old wood and cleaning solutions no longer registered in Brad's purified awareness. Breathing in deeply through his nose and exhaling across his hard palate, he meditated on the third space in front of his eyebrows, a technique he'd learned from The Tarot, one of Natalie's books. Really? What do you want to read that for? She had asked. That is some far-out shit. I couldn't get past the section on the tarot cards. Along with astrology, she loved tarot cards and the power they held to predict the future. But the rest of the book was Greek to her. She laughed at him mockingly. I'm just curious. I'll give it back in a few days, Mom. Brad was compelled by the author's promise that readers could obtain universal knowledge through the book's teachings. Brad wanted that knowledge, like a man baking in a desert wanted water. After breaking his wrists in gymnastics, he was in need of something to do anyway. He couldn't work out or throw papers, and without those outlets, he felt himself growing eager for a new way of challenging himself. Practicing meditation daily had brought him a sense of inner calm, making the chaos in the Rosedale household easier to live with. During meditation, his thoughts would ebb and flow like storm clouds that would suddenly clear, only to return and obscure the blue sky of inner peace. Breathing in, breathing out. A few moments of delicious calm. Then the thought clouds came back. He thought about getting evicted from their place on Allen Avenue and, and Grandma Mary coming in an old pickup with her second husband, Randy. She had yelled at him and his younger brothers. If any of you boys misbehave in my house, you will get your butt whipped and have to stand in the corner all day. Natalie had buttered her mother up and gave Randy a big hug and kiss. The old man got dizzy and his face turned red. Then they loaded up the truck. It took four crosstown trips to move all their stuff. They had to leave some furniture, but they took the TV. Grandma Mary had cursed Mo for not showing up to help, but she shut up when Natalie gave her a wad of cash from a welfare check. The eviction thoughts faded, and Brad settled into a deeper meditative state. By returning attention to his breath and reminding himself that he was meditating, he became calm again. The only thing in his awareness were the tinkling of pipes running along the floor above him and a car horn on the street outside. The smell of old, moldy wood came back, yet the sensations didn't bring any thoughts with them. His awareness was empty, and his body felt light as if it could float. His consciousness filled the space, as though it was all part of him, and that feeling prompted the thought of why he was now living in a basement. The thought clouds returned. The latest eviction had taken place after Brad turned 14 before the holidays. Mo was once again between jobs and working hustles, plays, with Shu. They would come in all excited in the middle of the night, get drunk, and pass out. Mo would give Natalie just enough cash for food, beer, cigarettes, and her astrology magazine. But eventually the good plays ran out, and the rent was months behind. When the sheriff posted notice, they had to get out. The options were to live in their car or put the kids in foster care. In desperation, Natalie called her mother and begged for a place to stay. Breathe in, breathe out, he remembered. Just like the book taught, he focused on his breath until his thoughts cleared again. Lightness returned to his body, and he sank into a deeper state, putting his focus back on the third space. The space in front of my third eye. There was a long moment of clear awareness before the thoughts came again. Uh-huh, hell no. Natalie had said when she saw the cluttered space Grandma Mary was offering up as Brad's bedroom. Shadows were cast by the dim light of a bulb that hung from a beam in the ceiling. There were piles of junk and dirty old car parts. Cobwebs hung everywhere, and it smelled dank and moldy. But Grandma overrode Natalie, and it took Brad days to clear everything out and make it livable. Memories emerged of his younger brothers crowded together in a small back bedroom, and Natalie and the baby settling into a tiny side room by the porch. Mo was out of town on business, she'd been telling people. Months passed and the meditations evolved. Sometimes he could sit perfectly still and calm for a whole hour. Then, on Saturday morning, he was visited. Sitting cross-legged on the old mattress, focusing on his breath and staying free of sensations or thoughts, he felt a warm tingling at the back of his head that seemed to expand into his face and chest. There was a presence. He was sure of it. And while part of him was elated, another part of him was scared to death. Nothing like this had happened to him before. Brad ignored the urge to look around. Keeping his eyes closed, the heads of three beings appeared in the third space, forming an inverted triangle. 
They had simple features and were larger than humans, giving off a bluish glow. It startled him, but not with fear. A resonant, masculine voice projected, To become square, square yourself. The words came from the air around him and inside his head at the same time. There was a ringing in his ears that faded after several seconds, even as the three heads held still and watched him. When he opened his eyes, the heads vanished. The elders on the big blue planet had waited for an opportunity to greet their younger brother. Brad's deep meditation had allowed them to triangulate and enter the mental space he'd created and deliver an important message of inspiration, as well as a clue on how to succeed on his human mission. The encounter took only seconds, but was seared into Brad's brain. The first impulse was to share it with his mother, which evoked the memory of the soap bar shoved in his mouth when he shared his discovery of fairies in kindergarten. At his age, she wouldn't get away with that again, but she would tell his grandma and father, and those two would make him wish he had kept his mouth shut. He realized there was not a person on earth with whom he could share this vision. The haunting and strangely familiar faces and the resonant words continued to replay over and over in his mind and even came to him in his dreams. He hoped for more wisdom, another vision, anything meaningful, so he kept meditating. Nothing came but peace and stillness. It was nice, but not enough to satisfy his new curiosity. He needed answers. The tarot book didn't shed light on the purpose of the visions or what becoming square could mean. He dug into the extensive shelves at the main library, coming across journeys out of the body, which described techniques for astral projection that began with meditation, just like what he'd been doing. The author described telepathic communications as related organized thought energy, or ROTEs, thought balls. It struck Brad that the vision was a telepathic communication, a thought ball inside his head. Maybe the visitation was to encourage him to develop psychic powers. It brought up his old desire to be like Superman. Right. A kid who couldn't hit back when he was getting his face punched. A gymnast with a broken wrist that took forever to heal. A paper boy working seven days a week who couldn't keep his family from getting thrown out onto the street. Superman sucks. He gathered and closed the books he'd spread all over the table and placed them in the cart for the librarian to return later. At his six-monthly follow-up visits to the children's clinic, the x-rays finally showed Brad's wrist fracture to be healed. The text sawed off his stinky cast that revealed deadly pale skin and a skinny arm with wasted forearm muscles. Everybody welcomed him back to the gym, but he had to start slowly. His wrist was so stiff, he couldn't even do a handstand. As the sophomore year at Pasadena High School progressed, Brad returned to gymnastics meets, but his wrist never fully recovered and his chances for a scholarship faded. At the age of 15, he had almost finished growing and had no problem lying about his age to get a job at McDonald's, where he could make more money than throwing papers and get free food. Decades later, Brad would learn that the visitation was for a reason more profound than anything he could have guessed, and that there was someone on earth who had the answer. <laughs>